So now we're going to work through the June Maths mock paper. Now, as always, there are different ways of doing things. Um, I will sometimes show you more than one method, but generally this will be the method that I feel is best. If you have another way of doing it, that's perfectly fine as well. You don't need to change necessarily. So looking at question one, so question one are your arithmetic questions. Now with these to ensure accuracy, um, avoid the temptation to do them mentally. Set out your formal methods. Make sure you line up your numbers clearly. Make sure you copy the sums, the numbers across from the sum correctly as well. That's often uh, can lead people to go wrong and make sure they're lined up. We're adding, so let's put a plus sign there to remind ourselves. Eight plus seven is 15, carry the one. Five plus six is 11, plus the one is 12, carry the one. Zero plus one is one and one plus nothing is one. So your answer here would be 1125. Make sure that you copy your answers over clearly and accurately into the answer box. So the next sum is a subtraction sum. So we have 3012 minus 524. So again, remember that you are taking away because you've just been adding and that can sometimes um, confuse people. We're gonna need to exchange. So we do 12 take away four is eight. Zero take away two, we can't do. We're going to need to exchange, but we're going to need to go over to this column, leave two behind, carry one across, leave nine behind, carry one across. 10 take away two is eight, nine take away five is four, two take away nothing is two, giving you an answer of two, four, eight, eight. So again, make sure you copy over accurately, make sure your numbers are formed clearly as well. So here we have 399 divided by seven. So you can do this short division or long division method. I'll model both just in case you're unsure of which one to use. So to make sure you get them the right way around, as you say the sum, write the sum. So it's 399 divided by seven. Seven will not go into three, carry the three across. Seven goes into 39 five times with a remainder of four, carry the four across, seven goes into 49, seven times, giving you an answer of 57. Now, if you use long division, you would do the same thing. So 399 divided by seven, seven will not go into three, seven will go into 39 five times, five times seven is 35. If you take that away from the 39, you're left with four, bring down the nine, Seven goes into 49 seven times. Seven times seven is 49. Subtract 49, you're left with zero, so your sum has come to an end and both, both methods will get you to the same answer. Moving on to question two. So question in two um, largely involves fractions. Now, when it comes to subtracting fractions or mixed numbers, you need the fractions to have the same denominator. So the first thing to do is change the denominator. One fifth and seven tenths. Fifths, five will go into 10. So we can change one fifth into tenths and to go from five to 10 up times by two. So one times two is two. So I have two tenths here and seven tenths here. Because this fraction, the second fraction is bigger than the first, I will need to get both of these into improper fractions. So to do that, we multiply the denominator by the whole number. So four times 10 is 40 plus two would be 42 and that will go over 10, and two times 10 is 20, plus the seven is 27. So we're doing 42 tenths, take away 27 tenths. If you want to, you can do your 42, take away 27 here. So exchange, 12 take away seven is five, three take away two is one. So we're left with 15 tenths would be your answer here, because we don't subtract the denominators, and 15 tenths, would be equal to one and five tenths and you could simplify that further to be one and a half and that's the answer you can put in your box there according to the mark schemes from the last couple of years this answer would be acceptable this answer would be acceptable this answer would also be acceptable but wherever you can always simplify it just to be on the safe side now when it comes to adding fractions again the denominators need to be the same so eight and three will both go into 24. So I'm gonna create two new fractions over 24. To go from eight to 24, I times by three. So seven times three is 21. And to go from three to 24, I times by eight. So two times eight is 16. And if we add those together, we get 37 
over 24. 24 will go into 37 once with a remainder of 13. So our answer here will be 1 and 13 24 37 24 would also be an acceptable answer. Now with part C, 6 times something equals 2 and 5 eighths. So this is like algebra. We have a missing unknown number in here. So if we were to leave that by itself on that side of the equal sign, 2 and 5 eighths, I'm going to change this into an improper fraction. So 2 times 8 is 16 plus the 5 is 21. So we have 21 over 8. We're going to move times 6 across the equal sign to join the 2 and 5 eighths. Now, when something moves across the equal sign, it has to do the opposite. So the opposite of timesing by 6 would be dividing by 6. And I can make my whole number 6 into a fraction by putting it over 1. Now, the rule for dividing fractions is keep, change, flip. And I'm just going to change my pen color. So we keep the first fraction. We change, divide to its inverse, which is multiply. And we flip 6 over 1 upside down, so it becomes 1 over 6. And then we multiply the tops, multiply the bottoms. So 21 times 1 is 21. And 8 times 6 is 48. 21 and 48 can both be divided by 3 to give our answer of 7 sixteenths. OK, this again, according to the latest mark scheme, would be acceptable, but wherever possible, remember to simplify and you can also write your answer in the box. Now for part D, this is addition with missing digits. So they've told you you must use the boxes. So your answers will go in the boxes here. This question is worth one mark. So all three numbers must be correct to get the one mark. So five plus something equals one. Well, this can't be one, so it must be 11. So we must have carried one across here and five plus six will give us 11. 9 plus something plus 1 equals 2. Well, this must be 12, so I'm going to put this over here. So 9 plus 1 would be 10. So to get to 12, I would need to have a 2 here. And 7 plus 5 is 12, plus the one we carried over would be 13. And then 1 plus 1 is, one plus one is 2, giving you 2,321. So for the one mark there, you would need to get all of these numbers, all of these missing numbers, correct in the spaces. On to question three. So question three is all about indices and powers and they often give you an example up the top. So four to the power of three means four times four times four. Fill in the boxes to complete these sums. So two to the power of what would be 256. Two to the power of one would be two. Two to the power of two would be four. And if you do it like this, you, you kind of, you're being methodical and you'll be able to keep track of how many twos you've used. Two to the power of three is eight and keep going and keep writing your total above so you know where you're at. Two to the power of two there is 64 times two would be 128 times two would be 256. So you have used two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You have multiplied two by itself eight times to get to 256. So your answer there would be eight. Now three to the power of something divided by nine equals nine. So again, we have a missing number here. So if we leave three to the power of something over here, it's going to equal nine. And we're going to bring divide by nine across the equal sign to join the other nine. Now, when it moves across, it has to do the opposite. So the opposite of dividing by nine is timesing by nine. So three to the power of something equals 81. So we can now work out how many times. So three to the power of one is three, times three would be nine, times three would be 27, times three would be 81. So one, two, three, four, this is three to the power of four. So we can put our four here. So with question four, you are being asked questions about fractions and decimals. You're being asked which is the smallest number, which number is closest in value to 0 0.78, and we're being asked the difference between the smallest and the largest number. So when you have to deal with fraction, a mix of fractions and decimals, my advice will always be to get your fractions into decimals. So three quarters is 0 0.75. 
If you don't know your fraction decimal equivalents, um, you need to remember that all fractions are essentially division sums. So for example, if you didn't know that three quarters was 0.75, you could do the sum three divided by four, which I will do over here. So three divided by four, and give yourself a decimal point and a couple of zeros for carrying. So four will not go into three, make sure your decimal points line up, carry the three across to the zero on the other side of the decimal point, and four goes into 37 times with a remainder of two, and four goes into 25 times. And that will be how you can convert any fraction into a decimal. And so four fifths is 0 0.8. All of my other decimals have two decimal places. So I'm gonna add a zero on there. So it also has two decimal places. Two thirds is 0 0.6 recurring. So to two decimal places, that would be 0 0.67 and then we have 0 0.65. So now we have all of our numbers as decimals, all of them to two decimal places, and you could, if you find it easier, read them as whole numbers. So which is the smallest number? Well, out of all of those, it would be 0 0.65. And which number is closest in value to 0 0.78? Well, 0 0.75 is minus 0 0.03. 0.72 is minus 0.06. 0.80 is plus 0.02. So 0.67 is minus 0.11. And 0.65 is minus 0.13. So your closest would be your four fifths. Okay, so you can put that in in its original form. You're being asked what the difference is between the smallest number and the largest number. Well, your smallest number you identified here was 0.65. Your largest number, if you look up here, if you're reading these as whole numbers, you've got 65, 67, 80, 72, and 75. So it would be 80 or 0.8. Make sure you have two decimal places and then do your subtraction sum. So we would need to exchange. 10 take away five is five, seven take away six is one, and you have 0 0.1. So on to question five. Here you've been asked, what is the sum of 45 millimetres, 35 centimetres, 0.25 metres and 0.015 kilometres? They've asked for your answer in centimetres. So before you do the sum, convert everything into centimetres. So there are 10 millimetres in a centimetre, so 45 millimetres will become 4.5 centimetres. This is already in centimetres, 35 centimetres. 0.25 metres, there are 100 centimetres in a metre, so you would times by 100, leaving you with 25 centimetres. And 0.015 kilometres, so with this one, you really want to go from kilometres to metres, and then from metres to centimetres. Now there are a thousand metres in a kilometre, so you would times by a thousand, so that would give you 15. Now 15 metres, to get that into centimetres, you times by a hundred, so you're gonna move that decimal point forward two more places, and you would be left with 1500 centimetres. And now you can add them all together. So 35 and 25 is 60, plus the 4.5 would be 64.5, Actually bring that in there as well and add that to 1,500 and you have 1,564.5 centimetres. Now question 5b, a rectangular tile has a width of 30 centimetres and a length of 50 centimetres. What is its area in metres squared? You've been asked for an answer in metres squared. So before doing the sum, you're going to convert your centimetre lengths into metres. So there are 100 centimetres in a metre, so 30 centimetres would need to be divided by 100 to give you 0 0.3, uh, 0 0.3 metres, and 50 centimetres would become 0 0.5 metres. And for area, your formula, the area of a rectangle is length times width. So we're going to be doing 0 0.3 times 0 0.5. When multiplying decimals, get rid of the decimal points and do a regular sum, so 3 times 5 equals 15. We have one, two decimal places in our sum, so we would need one, two decimal places in our answer, so we put our decimal point there and a zero in front, and the area of one of those tiles would be 0.15 meters squared. Now here, part C, 
you're being asked what the total area of 1500 of these 30 centimeter by 50 centimeter tiles be and you're again your answer is in meters squared well we know the area of one square meter or one tile rather we know the area of one tile is 0.15 meters squared so we would need to times that by 1500 so again the sum you're doing is 0.15 times 1,500. So we can do that as 1,500 times 15. And we would need two decimal places in our answer because we have two decimal places in our sum. So five times zero is zero, five times zero is zero, five times five is 25, five times one is five plus the two is seven. And then we're gonna times by 10. So we've got our zero placeholder in here. One times zero is zero. 1 times 0 is 0, 1 times 5 is 5, 1 times 1 is 1. Add these up, so we have 0, 0, 5, 12, carry the 1, 2. But we need two decimal places in our answer, so 1, 2, decimal point will go in there, giving us 225 square metres. On to question 6. Here we were told a baker is selling the following items at these prices. So four bread rolls for £1.50. Sausage rolls are 49p each. Six cupcakes for £4. And eight donuts for £3. What will it cost to buy 12 bread rolls, 24 cupcakes and 40 donuts? So let's work out the bread rolls first of all. The bread rolls come in packs of four. Four goes into 12 three times, so we need to do three times £1.50, which gives me £4.50 for the bread rolls. 24 cupcakes, the cupcakes come in box of six, boxes of six. Six goes into 24 four times, so we're going to do four times £4, which will give me £16. And 40 donuts, donuts come in boxes of eight. 40 divided by 8 is 5, so we need to buy 5 boxes at £3, so 5 times 3 equals 15, so £15 there. And if we add these together, £16 at £15 is £31, plus the £4.50 will give me £35.50. Which is the most expensive item if I want to buy 24 of each item? So, bread rolls come in packs of 4. Four goes into 24 six times. So we would need to do six times £1.50, which would give us £9. Sausage rolls are 49p each, so we would need to do 24 times 49. So nine times four is 36. Two times nine is 18, plus the three is 21. And then four times four is 16. Four times two is eight. So add those together and we get six, seven, eleven. So sausage rolls are eleven pounds seventy six. So this is your bread rolls. Sausage rolls is eleven pounds seventy six. Six cupcakes. So six will go into twenty four four times. Four times four is sixteen pounds. And eight donuts. Eight goes into twenty four three times. Three times three is nine pounds. So now we've worked out the cost of 24 of each of the items and our most expensive here is cupcakes. So that was what we were right here. Now part C, a customer buys a selection of items and their bill comes to eight pounds 96. How many sausage rolls did they buy? So for the bread rolls, the cupcakes and the donuts, if you were to buy any multiples of those, they the ones digit will always be a zero because bread rolls are one pound fifty, cupcakes are four pounds, and donuts are three pounds. The only item that has a ones number that is different from zero is sausage rolls. So we need to see how many forty nine p's we could get that would take up if we took them away. If we work out how many will go, will give us a number that we can take away to end up with a ones digit of zero. So 40, 1 times 49 is 49, 2 times 49 would be 98, 3 times 49 would be 147, 
4 times 49 would be 196. So this is the point at which we have a six in the ones column. And if we take £1.96 away from £8.96, we would end up with £7, which could be two packs of uh, bread rolls and a box of cupcakes, or it could be a box of cupcakes and a box of donuts. And then we would have bought four sausage rolls. So that's how you work that one out there. The fact that all of these effectively, if you want, if you like, have a zero in the ones column means we can work with the 49 to find out how many we would need to have to subtract and end up with one uh, with a zero in the ones column. On to question seven, we're told that A is three times smaller than B and B is half of C and A plus B plus C equals 80. Now, once you start to see language like three times smaller, four times bigger, half as big, twice as much, you can you can use ratio to solve these um, equations here. So in the working out space, I would give myself the column headings A, B, C, and I would also have a totals column over here. The first thing we need to decide which is the smallest number. So A is three times smaller than B. So A is smaller than B and B is half of C. So B is half of C. So therefore our smallest number must be A. So we're gonna give that a ratio of one. A is three times smaller than B. So B must be three. And B is half of C and three is half of six. So C must be six. And if we add those ratios together, we get a total of 10. Now, in terms of amount, at the moment, we only know the total amount. So we can put that over here in the totals column. And to go from 10 to eight, I've times by eight. So I can now times each of my ratios by eight to get my amount. So A would be one times eight, which is eight. B would be three times eight, which is 24. And C would be six times eight, which is 48. And when we add these together, they come to 80. So we know we've shared them appropriately. And we were asked to find B, or B is 24. And we were asked to find the value of C minus A. Well, C is 48, A is eight. So 48 take away eight will give you 40. In question eight, you're asked to find numbers X and Y, and you're told they add up to 78. And X is 14 more than Y. So to start with, write this out as a sum. So X plus Y equals 78. If they didn't have this difference of 14, they would be the same. So if we subtract the difference of 14, we end up with 64, at which point X and Y would be equal. So if we halve 64, X would be 32 and Y would also be 32. But we were told that X is 14 more than Y. So if we add the difference of 14 back onto X's value, X ends up being 46 and Y is 32 and 46 plus 32 equals 78. Okay, so on question nine, you're told that ABCD is a straight line drawn on a graph. The coordinates of B and C are shown complete the coordinates of A and D. Now this drawing is not to scale, so therefore don't try to put any labels on the coordinates. The only thing, whoops, that it's worth labeling is where the X and Y axes meet, this value would be zero. Okay, so this would be zero here. Now, you're looking for a pattern in the X coordinates. So we have zero, three, and nine. So this tells me, I, my first assumption here is we're going up in threes, but there's a coordinate missing. So I'm gonna put one in here, so that's six. And if we look here, we've got on the Y coordinate, let me just do this in a different color. We have four, six, therefore I would assume that this here would be eight and therefore this here would be 10. So that's got me my first mark because I've worked that one out there. Now, when I come down to point A, point A is sitting on the X axis, which means that it must have a Y coordinate of zero because it has not traveled up the Y axis at all. So therefore, I know I've got zero here. And if I look at my pattern here, I'm going 10, eight, six, four, zero. So there must be 
a coordinate with two in there already. Going back to my X coordinate, I'm going nine, six, three, zero. So I'm taking away three each time. So my next coordinate, my X coordinate would be minus three. And therefore, if I'm going down to here, this is going to be minus six. So this is how I would get my answer to A. So A has an X coordinate of minus six and a Y coordinate of zero. And you would get one mark for each of those that you've got correct. Coming on to question 10, this has the, this type of question here has the potential to waste a lot of time, particularly if you're not familiar with dealing with um, time calculations and time differences. If you're not confident with something like this, this question is worth leaving. Remember, each question is worth one mark and coming back to it if you have time. This also would benefit from you highlighting the key information in the question. So the total flying time from London to Tokyo via Frankfurt is 16 hours. The flight from London to Frankfurt is 10% of the flying time. The flight leaves London at 15.45. If Frankfurt is one hour ahead of London time, find in local time the arrival time in Frankfurt. Give your answer in 24 hour clock format. So. The first thing to look at here is your total flying time. Now, there are a couple of ways of doing this, and I'll show you two. So total flying time equals 16 hours. You know that London to Frankfurt is 10% of the total flying time. So 10% of 16 hours would be equal to 1.6 hours. Now, you need to be careful with decimals and time. 1.6 hours is one hour and six tenths of an hour. An hour has 60 minutes, so one hour equals 60 minutes. So six tenths of one hour, you would divide 60 by, uh, by 10. So six tenths, you would do 60 divided by 10 is six, and then you want six tenths, so you're gonna times by six, so that's equal to 36 minutes. So 1.6 hours is equal to one hour and 36 minutes. Frankfurt is one hour ahead, so we're going to add one hour. So our total journey time is two hours, 36 minutes, according to Frankfurt time. And you would add two hours and 36 minutes to 15.45. So if you draw yourself a little timeline, you're leaving at 15.45. If you go to the next hour, you would have 1600. So to go from here to here, you would add 15 minutes. You could then hop forward two hours to 1800. So you've used two hours and 15 minutes. So that leaves you with 21 minutes remaining. So your arrival time would be 1821. And that's one way of doing it using um, decimal time. If you were less comfortable with decimal time, you could change 16 hours into minutes. OK, so to do that, you would have to do 16 times 60. Which is equal to 960 minutes. 10 percent of 960 would equal 96 minutes. And that would give you one hour and 36 minutes. So you could get to the same place as we got to here and then you'd need to factor in your one hour time difference as well and you would get to the same place. So if you're not comfortable with decimal time, convert your hours into minutes and then find your percentage of the minutes and then convert back into hours. Now for part B, you're told a stopover in Frankfurt is two and a half hours and Tokyo is eight hours ahead of London time. Find in local time the arrival time in Tokyo and give your answer in 12 hour clock format. So our total flying time was 16 hours. We had a two and a half hour stopover in Frankfurt and Tokyo is eight hours ahead. So if we add all those together, we have 26 and a half hours we need to add on to our departure time. Now 24 hours, is one day, so that would take us straight back to 15.45 the next day. And that leaves us with two and a half hours to add on to 15.45. And again, you could draw yourself a little timeline. So to 1600 would be 15 minutes. 
we then got two hours to add on, which would take us to 1800 hours. And then we have 15 minutes remaining of the two and a half hours, which will take us to 1815. So this is 24 hour clock. 1815 would be 615 PM and the PM must be there because it's 12 hour clock format. On to question 11. Here you've been told a whole number A has been rounded to the nearest 100 to give 500 and another whole no number B has been rounded to the nearest 1000 to give 3000. So this is all about boundaries. So before you start to answer the question, you really want to get your smallest possible value and highest possible value for A. So it's been rounded to 500. The smallest possible value that could have been rounded up would be 450. And the highest possible value would have been 549. And for B, your number has been rounded to 3000 to the nearest thousand. Your smallest possible value would be 2500. And your largest possible value would be 3,499. So basically the gap between your biggest and smallest value when rounding to 100 is 99. And the gap between your smallest and largest when rounding to 1,000 is 999. So now you've got your smallest and largest values, answering the questions becomes easier. What is the largest possible value of A? Well, it will be 549. What is the smallest possible value for B minus A? So we want the smallest possible gap. So that will be the two numbers that are closest together in value for A and B. So it will be these two here. So you're gonna do 2,500 minus 549. So we'll have to exchange and exchange again. Now 10 take away nine is one, nine take away four is five, Four take away five, we can't do, we'll exchange again. 14 take away five is nine and one. And that will give you your answer there. Spend time doing this at the beginning will pretty much ensure you get your two marks for this type of question here. On to question 12, this involves pie charts. So with pie charts, you need to remember that pie charts have 360 degrees in them. Your answers will be will require you to give either an amount, a fraction, a percentage, or an angle. Okay, they will be what you are working on. And if you have some of the information, you can move between those quite easily. We've got two pie charts, one for Isaac and one for Charlotte. And we were told they both spent 100 pounds. So how much money did Isaac spend on travel? Well, Isaac's travel sector has a right angle and a right angle is equal to 90 degrees and 90 degrees is equal to a quarter. So we need to find a quarter because we're being asked how much money, a quarter of a hundred pounds would be 25 pounds. So that's our answer there. So for question 12b, you've been asked what percentage of her money did Charlotte spend on shoes? So Looking at Charlotte's pie chart, the shoe sector, we have 108 degrees. So we can make that into a fraction out of the total number of degrees, 360. And we can simplify that. 108 can be divided by 9. So that would give us 12. And 360 divided by 9 would give us 40. And 12 and 40 can both be divided by 4 to give us 3 and 10. So three tenths percentage, remember, is out of 100. So we need to make an equivalent fraction out of 100. To go from 10 to 100, we've times by 10. So three times 10 is 30, and that will give us a total of 30%. Now, part C is asking what fraction of his money does Isaac spend on stationery? And we need to give the answer in its simplest term. So if we go to Isaac's um, pie chart here. Stationary, we don't currently know the degrees. Now here we have a straight line and there are 180 degrees in a straight line. This is a 90 degree right angle. We have 54 here and 90 plus 54 is 144 degrees. And if we take that away from 180, we would have 36 degrees. 
and 36 degrees out of 360 degrees in total will give us a fraction of one tenth. So that would be your answer here. For part D, you're being asked, what is the angle of the snack sector for Charlotte's pie chart? Now, looking at snacks here, we have all of the angles for all the other sectors apart from snacks. So if we add those together, so 90 plus, 140, uh, plus 45 would be 135. We then have 36 and 54, which will add up to 90. We have 108 for the shoes sector. And if we add those together, we will get 333 degrees. And if we subtract that from 360, minus 333 would give us 27. So that would be our angle size, 27 degrees. And then the final question is asking, how much more money does Charlotte spend on presents than Isaac? So looking at here, Charlotte spends, her present sector has a, deg a 90 degree angle. So Charlotte spends a quarter of her money, which is equal to 25 pounds. So that's for Charlotte. Now, Isaac has for presents, Isaac's sector is 54 degrees. So that would be 54 out of 360. I'm gonna divide both of those by nine to give me six over 40. And I can divide that again to give me three over 20. Now, Isaac has a total of 100 pounds, so I can create an equivalent fraction with 100 at the bottom. So to go from 20 to 100, I'm timesing by five, and three times five would give me 15. So he spent 15 pounds of his 100 pounds on presents. So Isaac spent 15 pounds, Charlotte spent 25. So 25 minus 15 gives me 10 pounds. So with these pie chart questions, you can use the angles and the total amounts to work into percentages and degree missing angles and amounts, all of that kind of thing. So you're moving from one thing to the other all the time. On to question 13, you've been asked to calculate two sums here. So 2.5 times 1,000. So if we're times in by 1,000, we can move that decimal point forward three places and we would put our placeholder zeros in here. So this one comes to 2,500. And 1 1.36 times by 10,000, we have four zeros. So we're gonna move that decimal point forward four places. And if we put our two zeros in there, we would have 13,600. And then we just need to add them together. So 13,600 add 2,500, 0, 0, 11, 6, 1, giving us 16,100. Down here, we need to remember the rules of bid mass. So we need to do any brackets first. So 32 divided by three would be 44. So we've done our brackets. We're now gonna do our indices. So 12 squared is 144. We have no division. We have multiplication here. Three times five is 15. And we can put our signs back in. So we've got a subtract and we've got add. Now addition and subtraction, you have to do them in the order that they appear in the sum. So 144 take away 44 would be 100, plus 15 gives us our answer of 115. So with these bid mass questions, just be methodical, go through, do every bit um, in the order that it's supposed to be done in. This one here, this is a non-VR question. Um, so this will depend very much on your visualization skills. So you're told below the cube is made up of 64 two centimeter by two centimeter by two centimeter individual cubes. Because it's, these are cubes, obviously length, height and width will all be two centimeters. The first thing you're being asked is what is the volume of the cube above? So your formula for volume is length times height times width. And each of these edges here are two centimeters and you've got four of them. So two times four is eight. So we've got eight by eight by eight. So eight times eight is 64 and 64 times eight will be 
512. So that would be the volume of your cube. Now, how many of the individual cubes have no faces visible? So everything on the outside will obviously have at least one face visible. So we're looking for basically the core of the cube. Now, it will basically be what is underneath this top row and inside this front row here. So basically, if you can imagine, it's going to be these four cubes here that won't be visible, but in this row and in this row. So you're going to have two rows of four cubes, which means you have a total of eight cubes with no sides visible or no faces visible. And for part C, you're being asked what is the difference between the number of individual cubes that have three faces visible and those that have two faces visible. So again, try and be methodical in your approach here. The cubes that will have three vis faces visible are the ones in the corner. So this one here, and you can see better on this one here, we've got one, two, three faces visible. So you have four corner cubes at the top and you have four corner cubes at the bottom, all of which will have three faces visible. So four uh, corner cubes at the top, four corner cubes at the bottom, bottom, giving you a total of eight cubes with three faces visible. Now, the cubes that have two faces visible would be these ones here. Okay, you can see we've got two faces visible here. So you're gonna have two faces visible here and two faces visible here and two faces visible here. So in your top row, you have eight cubes with two faces visible. It's gonna be the same in the bottom. You're gonna have um, eight cubes with two faces visible. And then your two middle rows, these cubes here will have two faces visible, as will these, as will these, and as will the two cubes you can't see on the other side. So there's gonna be eight cubes with two faces visible there as well. So eight plus eight plus eight is 24. You've been asked to find the difference between 24 and eight, so your answer will be 16. Question 15, this is all about decimal calculations. So here, the most important thing with adding and subtracting decimals is that you line up the decimal points. So 2.78 add 23.6, it would be 23.6 add 2.78, and you can add your placeholder zero in there so that all of your columns line up. Put your add sign in to remind you what you're doing. Eight, six plus seven is 13, three plus two plus one is six, and two, giving you an answer of 26.38. Same with subtraction, make sure that your decimal points line up. So 5.2 minus 1.34. You will need your placeholder zero in here. Now zero take four, you can't do. So exchange, 10 take away four is six. One take away three, you can't do. So exchange to give you 11 take away three, which is eight. Four take away one is three and that will give you your answer here. Now, when it comes to multiplying decimals, I will always recommend that you get rid of the decimal points. So this sum will become 18 times three, but we have two decimal places in our sum. So we will need two decimal places in our answer. Three eighths are 24, three times one is three, plus the two is five, and we need two decimal places. So one, two, decimal point goes in there, giving us an answer of 0 0.54. Remember when you multiply by a number less than one, your answer will get smaller rather than bigger. And when it comes to dividing by a decimal, don't do it, multiply out by either 10, 100 or 1000 to make it a whole number. So 0 0.6, we wanna move that decimal place forward one space. So we're gonna times by 10 to give us six, and we must times by 10 on this side as well to give us 516. And our new sum, is 516 divided by six. Six will not go into five. Six goes into 51 eight times, carry three. And six goes into 36 six times, giving you an answer of 86. Because you multiply both sides out by the same factor, the answer to 516 divided by six is the same as the answer to 51.6 divided by 0 0.6. So there's no need to adjust your answer at the end. And it helps to be aware that if you're dividing by a number less than one, your answer will be bigger than what you started with as well. So moving on to question 16. These questions here all involve mean or reverse mean. Um, 
and we'll work through part A is probably the most straightforward. Again, highlight your key information so that you can keep track of what you're doing. Eight Alsatian dogs have a total weight of 300 kilograms. Find their average mean weight. So to find the average or the mean, we add everything together and divide by how many there are. In this case, they've given us the total weight, so they've added everything together. Now to find the average, we would need to divide 300 by how many dogs there are, which in this case is eight. And eight goes into three zero times, carry the three. Eight goes into 33 times, carry six. Eight goes into 67 times, and we have a remainder of four. So we can't just do remainder four, we're gonna put a decimal point in here and add a zero and carry that four across onto the zero. And eight will go into 45 times, giving us an average weight for the, five, for the eight dogs of 37.5. Down to question B, we have four Great Danes which have an average weight of 70 kilos. If two Great Dane puppies join them, the average weight for all six dogs is 57.5 kilos. What is the average weight of the two puppies? So we've been given the average weight for the Great Danes. So to get that, we've added the weight of the four dogs together and we've divided by four and it's given us 70. To find the total weight for the four Great Danes, we would need to go in reverse. So we would take the 70 and we would times by four, and that will give us a total weight for those four dogs of 280 kilograms. We'd then be given the average weight for all six dogs of 57.5. So we would then need to do 57.5 times six to find the total weight for the six dogs. So six fives are 30. Put your decimal point in, six sevens are 42 plus the three, 45. Six fives are 30 plus the four, 34. So the total weight for the six dogs is 345 kilograms. If we take away the total weight for the four Great Danes from all six dogs, we will get just the weight of the puppies. So we've got 345 minus 280. So five take away zero is five. Four take away eight we can't do. 14 take away 8 is 6 and 2 to 65. So 2 take away 2 we can't do. So we have a total weight for the two puppies of 65 kilograms. To find their average weight, because we have two puppies, we would divide by 2. So 65 divided by 2 will give you an average weight of 32.5 kilograms. Final question. We have two Labrador puppies with an average weight of 18 kilograms. The heavier puppy weighs twice as much as the lighter puppy. What does the heavier puppy weigh? So we've been given the average weight for the two dogs. So the two weights were added together and divided by two to give us 18 kilograms. So we would need to do 18 times two to get the total weight for the two dogs. Okay, so that's their total weight. Now we've got the heavier puppy and we've got the lighter puppy. So we're gonna use ratio here. The heavier puppy weighs twice as much as the lighter puppy. So the lighter puppy would have a ratio of one, the heavier would have a ratio of two. And if we add those together, we get a total of three. The total weight was 36. And to go from three to 36, we've times by 12. So to get the weights of the individual puppies, you times by 12. So two times 12 is 24. One times 12 is 12 and you were asked for the weight of the heavier puppy, so your answer here would be 24 kilograms. On to question 17, we're dealing with angles here. The shape below is an isosceles triangle. How many degrees is angle X? Now you've been told this is an isosceles triangle, so you know that this angle here and this angle here will be equal. Also, opposite angles, are equal, so this angle here will be 130 degrees, and 130 plus 130 is 260. And if we were to fill these in, this would be a two uh, a complete rotation, so there would be 360. So 360 minus 260 will leave you with 100 degrees, which has to be divided equally between these two, giving you angles of 50 degrees and 50 degrees. Now the total angles in a triangle add up to 180. So if we take that 50 degrees off, we would have 130 degrees, which needs to be shared equally between those two angles. 
which would give us an angle size of 65 degrees for angle X. And here we have a regular hexagon. So the fact it's a regular hexagon means all of its sides and all of its angles are equal. And the dot marks the center. How many degrees in angle A? Now, if we were to continue angle A around, this would be a full rotation, which would be 360 degrees. As this is a regular hexagon, we could split this into six equal triangles. And each of these angles here around the center would be the same size. And because we're going around the center, we have a total number of degrees of 360. So we would do 360 divided by six, which would give us 60 degrees for one of these pieces would be 60 degrees. And in this angle, we have one, two, three, four pieces. So it'd be 60 times four, which equals 240 degrees. On to question 18. This time we've been told the perimeter of a triangle is 95 centimeters and we've been asked to find X. Now, currently around the outside of this triangle, we have one X here, another X here and another X here. So write an equation for this. We have three lots of X. We are adding 12, taking away six and adding 32. So if we do 12 add 32, we'd get 44, take away six, would leave us with 38. So we're adding 38 and that equals 95. We would then try to find X. We're gonna leave X on its own and we're gonna have 95 take away 38, which would leave us with 57. So three lots of X would equal 57. And to find X, we would do 57 divided by three and three goes in once, carry two, nine. So the value of X would be 19. So 19 at 21 at 12 would be 31. 19 take away six would be 13. And 19 plus 32 would be 51. And if we add all those together, so 31 add 51 would be 82. 92, 95, we know that we've got the right answer. Question 19 is all about percentages. So find 25% of 180 pounds. Well, 10% would be equal to 18. 5% would be equal to nine. So you can do this, there's lots of different ways of doing this, but you could do to find 30%, you could do 18 times three, which would equal 54 plus nine, will give you 63. So your answer here would be 63 pounds. A kettle costs 65 pounds. Its price is reduced by 20%. What is the sale price? So 10% of 65 pounds, we would divide by 10, that would give us six pounds 50. So 20% would be double that, which is equal to 13 pounds. We've reduced it, so we need to take that 13 pounds away from the 65, and that would leave you with 52 pounds as your new sale price. Part C, the cost of a toaster is increased by 30%, and its new price is 104 pounds. What was the original price? Now you need to remember that the original price is always equal to 100%. So we had the original price, we increased it by 30%. So our new price is 130% of the original price. And that is equal to 104 pounds. We're trying to get to 100%. So the biggest number that will go into both 130 and 100 is 10%. And to go from 130 to 10%, we are dividing by 13. So you can come over here and do 104, divide by 13. Well, this isn't gonna help you much here, but if you think about it, 10 times 13 would be 130. So eight times 13 would be a good guess here, would be 104. So 13 is going in eight into 104, eight times. To go from 104 to eight, we divided by 13. Now to go from 10% to 100%, we need to times by 10. So we're gonna times this side by 10 as well, and eight times 10 is 80. So our original price was 80 pounds. Well, 10% of 80 pounds would be equal to eight. So 30% of 80 
would be equal to 24 and 80 plus 24 is 104. So that's how you can check you've got the right answer at the end. On to question 20. So with this question here, you've been given two sequences and you've been given the rules. Um, before you even begin, I'm going to recommend that you write your nth term expression for each sequence. Now for sequence A, you've been told to add four each term, which means that sequence A is behaving like the four times table. It's going up by four each time. Now the original four times table would look like this. And to go from four to 11, I have added seven, eight to 15, I've added seven. So I'm timesing by four and adding seven each time, timesing the term number by four. Sequence B is subtracting three each term. So this is the minus three times table. And the minus three times table would look like this. And to go from minus three to 102, I have added 105. And the sum of sequence A and B, well, it would be 4n minus 3n, which would leave us with 1n. And plus 7 plus 105 would leave us with plus 112. So I've now written three nth term expressions for each, uh, one for each sequence. So now answering the questions will be a lot more straightforward. What would be the 20th term of sequence A? So N stands for the term number. So for this one, I would do 4 times 20 plus 7, which will give me 87. At which term would sequence A reach 107? Well, my formula for sequence A is 4N plus 7, and it needs to equal 107. And then I would go in reverse. I would do 107 take away 7, would give me 100. And 100 divided by 4 is going to give me 25. So 4 times 25 would be 100, plus 7 will give me 107, to double check that my number is right there. At which term would sequence A equal sequence B? So we need 4n plus 7 to equal minus 3n plus 105. Now, when we teach this in class, we use highlighters to help keep it in order so we've got we want to get all of our ends together on this side and we want to get all of our numbers together on this side so all of our unknowns over here and all of our knowns on the blue side and we have currently let me just change to black so we have 4n here if we move minus 3n across the equal sign it will become plus 3n and we have 105 here and if I move plus 7 across the equal sign, it will become minus 7. So 4n plus 3n would equal 7n. And 105 minus 7 would equal 98. And to find n, I would do 98 divided by 7, which would equal 14. So that's how you would get your answer there. And on to question 21. This time you've been given a function machine and you've been told what you, what you need to do with your values for X and Y. So for your first question, you have been told that X equals four and Y equals three. So when we put X in, we times by four. So four times four is 16. When we put Y in, we times by two. So three times two is six. And then we've been told to multiply these together. So 16 times six, equals 96. Then we need to add 5 times y. Well, y is 3, so 3 times 5 is 15. So if we add 15 here, we get to 111. And then we're told to take away 4 times x. So 4 times 4 is 16. So we would minus 16, which will take us down to 95. And that is our output. So our output here is 95. For part b, You've been told that x is minus 3 and y is 5. So follow exactly the same pattern as you did before. So minus 3 times 4 would be minus 12. And 5 times 2 is 10. And when we multiply those two together, 12 times 10 is 120. And we have negative 12 and positive 10, so our answer will be negative. We are then adding 5 times y. So y is 5. 5 times 5 is 25, so we're going to add 25, which will take us to minus 95. So remember when you're adding, 
you are always moving up the number line. So you're going to go from minus 20 to minus 95. We are then taking away minus, uh, we're taking away 4x. So x is minus 3, 4 times minus 3 is minus 12. So we're taking away minus 12. A minus and minus makes a plus. So we are adding 12 and this will take us to minus 83. Now part C, if x equals 6 and the output is 188, find y. So we know our end result is 188. We know that x is 6, so 6 times 4 is 24. And 24 times 2y plus 5y minus, now we can work out 4x. So x is 6, 4 times 6 is 24, minus 24 equals 188. So if we go backwards, we would add 24 to 188, which would give us 212. 24 times something plus something equals 212. So 24 times table, well, 24 times 10 would be 240, which is too much. 24 times 9 would be 216, which again is too much. And 24 times 8 would be 192. So we've got 292. So it's looking likely that we're doing 24 times 8. So 2y would have to be equal to 8. So therefore, y would have to equal 8 divided by 2, y would have to equal 4. Let's just check if that works. So if we do 24 times 8, we get 192, plus 5 times 4, plus 20, to give me 212. Take away 24, give me 188, so therefore, y must be 4. OK, so that's how you would work out that one there. And on to the last question, question 22. At the supermarket, two bottles of milk, three cans of soda cost £3.90. Two milk and three soda cost £3.90. At the mini market, milk costs the same as the supermarket, but the cans of soda cost 20% more. Two bottles of milk, three cans of soda cost £4.20. Find the price of the milk and the price of one can of soda in the mini market. OK, so in the supermarket, make this into an equation. We've got 2m plus 3s equals 390. And in the mini market, we have two milk plus three sodas equaling 420 pence. The difference between these two is 30p, and that is equal to 20% more on the cans of soda. Now, there are three cans of soda, so each can of soda must cost 10p more in the mini market, so it costs 10p more, and that is equal to 20%, that 10p is equal to 20% of the total price. To get to 100%, we would need to times by five, and 10 times five is 50p. So each can of soda in the supermarket must cost 50p, and each can of soda in the mini market must cost 60p. So three times 60 is one pound 80. Um, and we're gonna work on the mini market because that's where they want to know the price from. So if we do four pound 20 minus the one pound 80 that the three cans of soda cost, that will give us 240 pence. And we can divide that by two to get the price of a bottle of milk. So the milk will be 120p or 240p in total, 120p each. And the soda cans here are 60p. So a can of soda costs 60p and a bottle of milk costs 120p or one pound 20. You can do it either way. And I hope you found that useful.